In this presentation, we will discuss the weighted average inventory method using a periodic system. The weighted average method as opposed to a first in first out or last in first out method. The periodic system as opposed to a perpetual system. We want to keep the other systems in mind as we work through this comparing and contrasting. We're going to be working with this worksheet, entering this information here. It's important to note that this worksheet is a worksheet that can typically be used with any of these inventory flow type problems, of which there are many. We have first in, first out, last in, first out, the average method, and then we have a perpetual and periodic system which can be used with any of those methods. It's also possible for questions to ask for just one component, such as cost of goods sold or ending inventory and therefore it can seem like there's more types of problems that we can have in that format as well. If we set up everything in a standard way, even if that weighs a little bit longer for some types of problems, it may be easier because we can just memorize that one format to set things up. This would be a format to do that. This would be breaking up the information into three components, purchases, cost of merchandise sold, and inventory or ending inventory. Within those three components, we're going to have the quantity, the unit cost, and then the total cost and in each of these three sections. And then we'll enter the data through this worksheet as we go, starting this time with the beginning inventory. So this is where we start at the beginning of the month, in this case, the month of March. We're going to say the beginning inventory is 100 units, costing $50, 100 times 50 being 5,000. We're going to put that same 5,000 out to the total column just to give an indication as we go through this worksheet of what the total is in its own distinct column out in the total section. So there we have that 5,000 units. That's where we start. If we look at our trial balance, it will be in order. Assets, li liabilities, equity, revenue, and expenses, debits, non-bracketed or positive numbers, credits, bracketed or negative numbers, the debits minus the credits equaling this zero. We have net loss in this case, meaning revenue of zero minus these expenses, five, three, and 9,920, giving us a loss of 10,720. We're focusing here, of course, this time being the inventory on inventory. This 5,000 matching what we just put into our worksheet. That is our beginning balance. That's where we start. Next, we will have a purchase of 400 units at $55. We're going to put that into our worksheet in the purchasing section. Remember that the purchases will not differ no matter what method we will be making, whether that's FIFO, LIFO, average, perpetual, or periodic. It will be what it is in March. It was 400 units that we purchased at $55. Notice the rising prices from 50 to 55 for the inventory units we are purchasing. Same units, costs going up. That's going to be the standard assumption that will happen. You want to just remember it going one way as if cost increase would be the norm. And then if it goes the other way, then we can kind of just reverse some of the effects that would happen. So in other words, as costs rise, what's going to be the effect on ending inventory and cost of goods sold under the three methods, LIFO, FIFO, and average, and then reverse the effects, obviously, when costs then fall. So we're going to have the 400 times the 55, that'll be the 22,000. Then we're going to do our average calculation. Now it's possible since we're doing a periodic system to just do all of the purchases and then calculate the average at the end. But we're going to calculate the average as we go to get practice calculating the average. It can be something that uh, people find a little bit more confusing because of the weighted average that we will be using. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate our average by putting the calculation all under this line, under this date line. Again, moving this amount down. So there's our 100 units at 50 or 5,000. Uh, then we're going to move this column over and there's our 400 units at 55. So we started at 100 units at 50. We got 400 units at 55. What we want to do now is create the average. Now I'm going to show the wrong way to do this first of all and then we'll uh, calculate the weighted average. So the a normal average of just the two prices would be 50 plus 55. Those two numbers divided by two would give us an amount right in the middle of them at 5250. Which seems reasonable, 5250 seems reasonable, however it's not exactly right because there's a lot more of the 55 units, 400, than the 50 units, 100. And therefore the weighted average taking that into account would be closer to the 55 than to the 50. 
So that's the mistake we just have to kind of avoid. How are we going to do this? We're gonna take the total here, the total dollar we spent and the total units and then divide those out. So it can look, look a little bit confusing on the worksheet because we're first gonna calculate or sum up the units, 100 and 400. We're not gonna sum up the uh, unit cost. That doesn't really make any sense because it's the unit cost. We can sum up the total here, 5,000 and 22,000 for 27,000, and then take this 27,000 divided by 500. So now we're simply taking the 27,000 divided by 500, and that gives us the 54, which is closer to this number that's the weighted at the 400 units. So we get 54 as our total. If we pull that out to the outer column, then the 27,000 is what should be on our financial statements in ending inventory and our trial balance. We're gonna record the journal entry here now. Here's gonna be our new thing that happened. We purchased another uh, 400 units for 22. We're gonna uh, adjust inventory. Inventory has a debit balance. We're gonna make it to go up by doing the same thing to it. Another debit of 22,000. Then the other side's not decreasing cash, but increasing the liability, accounts payable. Therefore, we will increase accounts payable by the 22,000. Posting this out then, we have the inventory. Inventory is up here. It started at 5,000. It's gonna go up by the 22,000 to 27,000. Then we have the accounts payable. Accounts payable 12,150 going up by 22,000 to 34,150. Note, once again, this transaction is going to be the same no matter what method we are using. If we see everything here, we're going to say that we're still in balance. No effect on net income. The purchase of inventory was not expensed at the time of purchase. It will be expensed, but not till it's used in order to generate revenue in accordance with the matching principle. That will be when cost, when we sell it in the form of cost of goods sold. However, under a periodic system, we're not going to be, get around to recording that cost of goods sold until the end of the time period, until we do a physical count, the end of the month, the end of March in this case. Next transaction, we're going to say that there's a sale of 420 units at $85. Now, if we were using a perpetual inventory system, we would have to record the reduction of inventory and the cost of goods sold along with the sale into our worksheet. We're not looking at the worksheet here because we're in a periodic system and we're not going to record that component until the end of the period with a physical count. What we will record is just the journal entry, just to demonstrate uh, this journal entry, the sales journal entry, which will be the same under the two methods, a periodic and perpetual, the second piece being the difference. So remember that if we make a sale in a merchandising company, we typically assume that it's going to be a perpetual system and we often break out that journal entry when considering it and thinking about it into two journal entries, meaning we have the sales side and then we have the, um, the inventory or cost of goods sold side of the journal entry. The sales side we can think of as similar as if we were a merchandising company and we can just eliminate the inventory and say, hey, what would happen if we uh, had a sale or did services and got paid or on account, meaning we got an accounts receivable, what would be the journal entry? Cash is not affected. Accounts receivable has a debit balance. We got more of it. People owe us money. Therefore, accounts receivable will go up with another debit. So we're going to debit accounts receivable. And then we're going to credit something and the something will be revenue. That revenue for a service company might be fees earned or if it might be revenue or income. <laughs> And it could be called sales for a merchandising company, but it's all just a revenue account. So it's going to go up in the credit direction. This is kind of our normal journal entry that we see whenever we make a sale, whether it be merchandise or a service type business, uh, accounts receivable going up, revenue going up. Then we have the second component that we typically think of when we make a sale as a merchandiser, meaning we sold merchandise. Inventory should be going down and the related cost of goods sold should be going up. We're not going to record this under a periodic system. That's the difference between a periodic system and perpetual system. We're only going to record the decrease in inventory and related cost of goods sold expense at the point at the end of the period, the end of the month in this case, the end of March, uh, after we do a physical count. Why? Why would we do that? Why would we not decrease the inventory? We know the inventory went down and it's probably just the sophistication of the system. If, uh, we, if we have a clerk or someone 
recording these sales, it's easy to know what the sales price is, but this sales price has nothing to do with the cost of goods sold, or in other words, the cost of goods sold might have been used to make that sales price, but uh, this, there's no direct relationship between these two things. The sales price is known when we make the sale, so 420 times 85, that's the 35,700. That's what we want to focus on, collecting the revenue and making the sale at the point of sale. We don't want to spend all of our time training people how to record the, the cost of goods sold or inventory if they have to do it manually, because that could take some time, especially if there's multiple products that we are selling. If, however, it's an electronic scanner system that does it at that point in time without us even needing to know what the cost is, then that makes it a lot more doable to do a perpetual system which would be better from an accounting standpoint. If we don't have that sophistication, we may be using a periodic system, which will simplify the process, but we know that it won't be entirely accurate until the end of the time period. So if we post this out then, accounts receivable, debit balance, we're posting this 35,000 to it, going from 44,900 up by 35,700 to 80,600. Then the revenue is going up from zero. We're posting this revenue up from zero by 35,700 to 35,700. If we look at our full transaction, we're back in balance. Net income is going up uh, drastically. It went up a lot, it went up by 35,700. So 35,700 minus these expenses is 24,980. So that's gonna be our net income. Note it's really not exactly correct now, of course, because we haven't recorded the cost of goods sold. And that's gonna be a substantial expense that we haven't recorded. We haven't recorded the decrease in inventory. So our assets are overstated. We will do so at the end of the time period, the end of the month, the end of March. Next we have on 318, purchased 120 units at $60 per unit. So once again, we'll be in the purchases column. This will be the same as in any method, first in, first out, last in, first out, average, perpetual, periodic. These purchases are what they are. This is what we will actually pay for the inventory. We're gonna have the 120 units at $60. Note the rising prices from 50 to 55 to 60. That's not because the units got better. That's not because we're buying better widgets or better inventory. The price is just going up and that's gonna be the standard. Uh, prices increase in the standard for these types of problems, the standard for practice uh, as well due to inflation, if nothing else. The 120 times the 60 will give us the 7,200. Now we're going to calculate the average once again. Remember that if we're doing a periodic system, we could uh, calculate the average basically at the end and uh, sum up all of them. But I want to calculate the average each time we make a new step because this is the most complex component typically. What we're going to do is draw a line here. We're going to bring this amount down. So this is what we had before. We had 500 units at $54. That's uh, 27,000. Then we're going to pull over the new information. Here's the new information. What we are not going to do when calculating the average, what you want to avoid, be careful of, is to just take the amounts, the 54 plus the 60. The 54 being the old uh, average plus what our new inventory costs and taking that and dividing it by two. What's the problem with that? It looks like a reasonable number, but it's not taking into account the weighted average. It's not taking into account that we have 500 units at 54 and only 120 at 60, and therefore, this number should not be right in the middle, but leaning towards the 54. So instead, what we're gonna do is sum up the total units we have, the 500 and the 120, then sum up the total dollar amount that we paid for those units, uh, 34,200, and then we'll do the division problem. That division problem being the 34,200 divided by the 620 units, giving us a number of 55,16. Note it's not gonna round specifically to the penny. That's okay, that happens in practice. Uh, we're gonna round it to the penny because we're talking about dollars and cents here. So we're gonna say that, uh, calculate that, That's, that number here is gonna be this number divided by this number, or the total dollar amount divided by the quantity. So that's gonna give us the 34,200 that we want to get to on our trial balance now in our financial statements. We're gonna do that, record in the journal entry. The journal entry will be the same under any method, FIFO, LIFO, average, because it is a purchase. That's not the side that differs, the side that's differing 
is when we make the sale. So we're going to say that uh, inventory has a debit balance. We need to make it go up. So we're going to do the same thing to it. Another debit. So here's the debit to inventory. The other side's not going to be paid with cash. We're going to increase the liability. So the liability has a credit balance. We're going to increase accounts payable, therefore, by a credit of 7,200. Posting this out then, we have the inventory in the journal entry. The inventory up here in the assets, we started with 27,000. It's going to go up by 7,200 to 34,200. Then we have the accounts payable. We have the accounts payable here. It's at 34,150. We're going to increase it in the credit direction. 7,200 to 41,350. So there's going to be our transaction. This 34,200 matches what we just calculated on our worksheet. The 34,200, the inventory worksheet supporting the inventory amount reported on the trial balance or the balance sheet. Here's going to be the full transaction. We still have the 34,200. We're back in balance indicated by the green zeros. No effect on net income, no effect on these accounts, the revenue or expense accounts. We will be affecting the revenue expense accounts by the inventory that we purchased, not at the point of purchase, but at the time we sell the inventory in the form of cost of goods sold. However, under the periodic system, we won't be recording that until the end of the period when we do the physical count. We're going to do another purchase here, purchase 200 units at $62. So we are going to be in the purchases column once again the $200 per 200 unit purchase at $62. Note the rising prices going from 50 to 55 to 60 to 62. Same units, unit cost going up because of, if nothing else, inflation. That will be the norm. You want to think that it can go down, but you probably want to think the norm will be increasing prices and then reverse your thought process for it to go down. The 200 times the 62 gives us 12,400. We're going to calculate our average now, and we could do this at the end of the time period under a periodic system for the average method. We're going to do it as we go, this being the key component to the average system calculating that average cost. To do so, we're going to draw a line under our last date line, and we're going to be putting this new information here, taking this 620 down, just copying that down, and then we're going to pull over our new information. And once again, we're going to say what not to do, which is a common, common error in calculating this. And that's going to be taking the 55.16 plus the 62 or the two prices and just dividing by two. That's an average, but it's not the weighted average because it's right in the middle of those two costs. And it should be leaning towards the 620, it being weighted higher, it having more inventory in it. So what we're going to do instead is we'll sum up the 620 and the 200 to get the 200, the 820. Then we'll sum up the 34,200 and the $12,400 amount to get to the 46,600. And then we can do our average. We're gonna take the total dollar amount, the 46,600, divided by the 820 units, giving us a average of 56,83, rounding up not worrying about the fact that we have all these decimals we're going to use the rounding to the pennies talking dollars and cents so that's going to give us the 5683 that's going to be this number divided by this number there's the total that we are going to be reporting on the financial statements we will now record the journal entry for that new purchase the purchase of the 12400 remember that the journal entry will be the same under lifo fifo average periodic perpetual all of them this is not an estimate we're going to say that the inventory started at uh, the debit balance and we're going to increase it. We bought more inventory with a debit of that $12,400. we are going to credit not cash, but the liability of accounts payable, increasing the accounts payable. Posting this out, we have the inventory here going to the inventory there, starting at $34,200, increasing by $12,400, going to a total of $46,600. Here's the accounts payable there. It's going to be posted here. We've got a credit balance starting at $41,350, increasing $12,400 to $53,750. Noting that the inventory that we end up with is supported by our inventory worksheet. Now we're going to do the inventory count at the end of the time period. This is what we're going to do in a periodic system in order to record the cost of goods sold for the entire period, what we have not been doing for the entire period, and record the related reduction in inventory, something we haven't done. So you'll note 
that as we go in our worksheet, we've just been doing purchases and we've been increasing and increasing with purchases, not recording the decrease in the inventory for these sales. And we're gonna do that at the end of the time period due to and with the help of a physical count and the cost of goods sold calculation. Cost of goods sold calculation, a mandatory calculation, something we really have to know, both in terms of units and in terms of dollars. The format will look like this, beginning inventory, plus purchases, gives us goods available for sale or amount available for sale, minus the ending inventory will give us cost of goods sold. That's gonna be our calculation. Now note that uh, a multiple choice question might ask you for any component, just give you three, uh, one unknown for this formula. They might give you the beginning inventory as the unknown, for example, or the purchases as the unknown. Now you could write this formula as beginning inventory plus purchases, skip the subtotal, beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold and write it out as an algebraic equation giving any of these unknowns then as long as we only have one we would then be able to find out any of these uh, amounts so keep that in mind you don't want to remember multiple different equations to figure out for example purchases or beginning inventory you want to remember one equation <laughs> cost of goods sold that can answer any of those types of questions uh, you do need to know this subtotal, however, by name, even if you don't use it in the equation, if, if you pull it out for an, an equation, uh, because some problems will refer to it as well as in practice. We're going to do this calculation first for the units, and then we'll do the same calculation in terms of dollars. We started off with 100 units, that's what we began with. We purchased 720 units, 400 plus 120 plus the 200 in the purchases section. That gives us 820 available. That doesn't mean we had 820 at any given time in our warehouse, but within the widget warehouse, we had 820 go through it, meaning we started with 100, we purchased 720. We may have sold items throughout here. We don't know what we sold, but we know what we purchased and therefore had available for sale, hence the name, goods available for sale, and that's 820. Then we're gonna do the physical count so we're going to say there's 240 widgets left in the widget warehouse. So there's 240 left. So if we had 820, we could have sold 240 are still there. Given our physical count, then the difference between the two is 580. That's what we sold in terms of the widgets. It is possible that we had shrinkage or theft of, or spoilage or something as well, which is why the perpetual system uh, would be nice to use because it can ver verify or better verify that type of problem. Uh, but our assumption is it's sold, and the assumption is that the shrinkage of any kind, breakage, theft, is uh, immaterial in, in relation to it, and therefore we're gonna record this entire amount to cost of goods sold. So note what we did here. We just basically said, hey, this is the amount we had available, and then allocated it out between either what's still left in ending inventory and what has been sold. We're gonna do that same thing with dollars. It would be a very easy conversion if the dollar amount were the same throughout the entire period, but very often it is not, even though we're talking about the same widgets. We're not buying different types of things. It's all the same, but the dollar amounts are increasing. So that makes it a little bit difficult. If we see this, then we're gonna say, well, we started with $5,000. That's our beginning balance. We know that. We purchased 720, and we purchased them for 41,600. We can't convert from 720 to 41,600 easily because of the different dollar amounts but we know what we purchased. We can just look at the GL and say, hey, we, we increased inventory. That's how much we're gonna pay. It's not an estimate. This is what we're gonna pay. 22,000 plus 7,002 plus 12,004. That's a given, that's not an estimate. And so if we add those two up, we're at 46,600. That's where we stop. Now we're gonna allocate that out between ending inventory and cost of goods sold. However, uh, we know that there's 240 units that were still in ending inventory, but now we have to figure out our conversion here because we need to know which of those uh, units. We purchased some for 50, some for 55, some for 60, some for 62. That's what we'll do now in the average method. And the average method, because we've been calculating it as we go, is nice and easy right now. We're just gonna say, well, yeah, some of them cost 50, 55, 52, 60, whatever, but they all cost around about an average, if we averaged them all out, a weighted average of $56.63. So we're gonna say whatever we sold, in this case, uh, 580 units. Those 580, 
we sold for this 56.83 about. If we multiply 580 times 56.83, we get 32,960.93, and that's our cost of goods sold. This is the cost of goods sold we haven't been recording the entire time period. It's the cost of goods sold that we would record every time we make a sale under a perpetual system. The cost of goods sold we are now recording for all sales happening during the time period, in our case, the month, the month of February, March, month of March. So we have uh, 820 units that we had before minus the eight, the 580 means we still have left 240. So we did this allocation of the 820 units, 580 have been sold and 240 are still left. They are at 5683. If we multiply 240 times the 5683, we get 136902. So now we can fill out the rest of this form. We can say, okay, the ending inventory is 13,639.02. And we could subtract this out then. And notice we did take off the rounding here. So here we have the pennies. Here we remove the pennies. It's just rounding. So if we take off the 46,600 minus 13,639, we get the 32,961 which is also matching this amount, 32,960, rounding 961. So that's how that ties out. We're gonna do our final journal entry now. This would be the journal entry that we would see under a perpetual system every time we record a sale, or a similar one at least, one that would be reducing inventory and recording cost of goods sold. Uh, but under a periodic system, as we are doing now, we will only see it one time at the end of the period, whatever period that may be, for our case, the month, the month of March. So we're going to record the reduction of inventory for the entire time period. Inventory is a debit balance. We're going to make it go down by doing the opposite thing, a credit. And the related cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is an expense. It's going to go up in the debit direction, bringing net income down. So here's the cost of goods sold and there's the inventory. So once again, this is the journal entry we would see each time under a periodic system as we record sales. It's going to be the second half of the sales transaction. But under a perpetual, under a periodic, under a, that would be the case under a perpetual system. But under a periodic system, we're only going to record it for the entire sales, all sales made during the period at the end. So if we record this, here's cost of goods sold, here's cost of goods sold here. It's going to go from zero way up by the 32,961 to 32,961. Here's inventory. Here's inventory. It's at 46,600. It's going to go way down by 32,961 to 13,639. This number now matching the 13,000 in ending inventory. This number now matching our cost of goods sold calculation. So note that before we did this transaction, our net income was way too high and now it's way lower. So that's gonna be the case for the periodic system. Our, our net income cannot be trusted until we do this transaction, the cost of goods sold being huge for a merchandising company typically. Also, our assets will be way overstated until we do this end of period adjustment because once again, the inventory is typically a fairly large asset and uh, it's not being reduced as we make the sales. So we gotta wait till the end of the period to have an accurate number there. If we look at the comparisons, here's our calculation, here's our worksheet, here's our trial balance. We can see that we have the ending inventory here we have the ending inventory on the uh, trial balance, which would be on the financial statement. We have the ending inventory on our worksheet. We have the cost of goods sold here on the cost of goods sold calculation, cost of goods sold on our merchandise uh, cost of goods sold worksheet. And then we have the cost of goods sold here on our uh, trial balance as well, which would also be on the income statement.